So let's focus on the small intestine. Well, the structure of the small intestine is actually made out of villi. Okay, villi is any these projections of mucosa along the whole lumen of the small intestine. Well, the logic again is the same as we discussed before with the surface area. <clears throat> Imagine for a second that if the small intestine did not have just these uh, did not have these folds and had only just a straight line. Well, this would in, this would mean that the surface area would be way way lower. So if when when these uh, when the mucosa actually forms this lining, this villa, this villa structure, this is actually a way for the human body to increase the absorption area, the, the, the surface area, and as a consequence to increase the surface absorption, the active absorption area. So this is the first way that we increase the surface area. The second way is using specific structures along with the, along the columnar cells of the mucosa of the small intestine. So first off, the, small, the, the mucosa lining of the small intestine is made out of two different cells the enterocytes and the panath cells. The panath cells are simple cells of innate immunity and they simply, as, as the name suggests, as the, as the immunity says, this is again <coughs> a non-specific uh, non antibacterial, anti, uh, antibacterial property, antibacterial surface. So uh, furthermore, we also have the mucous cells. Now the, these mucous cells are called actually goblet cells. Now the cells are, are, there, are pyramidally shaped cells that in fact produce mucins in fact, the mucins here play a different role. It's not just mucus in order to lube up the surface. And actually here, the point, the, the, the focus point of the mucus, the mucins of the goblet cells, is again to maintain a bacterial balance. Now, how is that? Well, the mucins, in fact, that are being produced on the surface of the goblet cells, along the whole lining of the villi, in fact, grow in size and multiply in size approximately 5 to 20 times of the original size. Imagine that you're throwing a pea-sized a pea on the in the <coughs> in the surface of the mucosa and in the end after the after the excretion, the secretion of this pea, it actually grows into a big boulder. This is pretty much the difference in the sizes. 5 to 20 times of the original size. So this induces the shedding, this continuous shedding of the normal bacterial flora. So this in a way maintains a proper balance of shredding bacteria and of course the bacteria themselves being made to proliferate and to maintain the population in a very stable range pretty much. Now back to the enterocyte. This is the, the actual the active cell of the whole small intestine this is the cell that absorbs high amount of nutrients. Now these enterocytes on the top they have this specific the microvilli. As the name suggests, it's again, it's the mild, small version of the villi. Again, these wave-like projections, we already discussed the macrovilli in the epithelial uh, video. But again, the point of this macrovilli is to increase the surface area. Well, it's important to notice and that, and that to mention that the whole layer of the macrovilli that cover up the whole, the whole segment of the villi are actually is also called glycocalyx. Glyco because it's filled with saccharides and calyx because it covers up the whole structure. So this glycocalyx, and also this is also from the brush the brush border. These terms are very similar. The brush border is the whole lining and the glycocalyx is specifically the saccharidic points of the of the brush border. So this glycocalyx on the top on this part contains specific enzymes that cleave uh, saccharides and protein proteins. In this way we actually had end up with shredding all the original micro big molecules, the polymers, into small monomers. For example, the proteins, the whole polypeptidic chains are now up to, they're actually being cleaved many, many times, and in this way you have the amino acids. So the amino acids can be absorbed through the enterocyte. Now, the same with saccharides. We had in the beginning a starch, let's say for the oral cavity, and through, throughout the whole process of the oral cavity, the whole passage of, through oral cavity, stomach, or esophagus and stomach, which the small intestine, in which we also find the desaccharidases, the the, sac the, sac the enzymes that cleave the two, uh, the two monomers of saccharides close together, and in this case, the desaccharides will cleave these parts and absorb the glucose or fructose or whatever other saccharide where it is in the lumen of the small intestine. Very, very important to notice the enzyme of enteropeptidase. This will make full sense when we talk about in the next video about the GIT in or glands, specifically in the pancreas. The pancreatic enzymes will be activated through the use of enteropeptidase. One of the mechanisms of this activation is the enteropeptidase. This is one of the ways that we ensure 
that these very, very important enzymes, the digestive enzymes of the pancreas, will be activated in the small intestine and nowhere else in the human body. We'll discuss, of course, there are other mechanisms, but this is one of them as well. So this, uh, this structure of forming villi, and on top of that, macrovilli, increases the surface area to 200 square meters. This is a massive area that we, that we can barely even fathom that we actually have contained this to the, the restricted area of the small intestine. Now, along the whole mucosal line, we'll find also N cells. These are called also microfold cells. These are antigen-presenting cells. In fact, the phagocytose bacteria or any other pathogen. And then, they, of course, as the, name, as the name of the function, typical function of the APCs, they express, they initiate a whole uh, specific response against these uh, antigens. Now we talk about the, the, the goblin cell, the goblet cells, and this is time to talk about the Lieberkuhn crypts. Now the Lieberkuhn crypts are these invaginations along after the villa. Of course, this is the level, let's say, of the where the villa starts. There are invaginations that these are called Lieberkuhn crypts. Now the Lieberkuhn crypts are serve the purpose that they, of course, again the surface area, and they're typically covered. Here's where we find the typical presence of the uh, of the panath cells, the innate immunity cells. Now, the small intestine, of course, is composed of three different, uh, three different portions. We have first the jejunum, sorry, first the duodenum, then jejunum, then ileum. What is very, very important to understand is how we can distinguish macroscopically these three areas. We'll discuss this in just a bit, using, of course, some special and unique structures that we find along the whole three difference, the difference between duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. We'll discuss them in just a bit. So this is, again, the very, very nice picture that shows and previews the whole different components of the, of the villi. First off, we have the vascular one that shows the artery and the vein. Of course, we need to have a very, very richly a vascularized, sorry, vascularized structure because we have to, of course, uh, use and uh, actually place all these, these uh, monosaccharides to use all the amino acids and everything that we find in the bloodstream so we can, of course, be able to absorb them efficiently. Now, we have also the lacteal. The lacteal is a lymphatic capillary. But why would we have a lymphatic here when actually the immune response would be placed lower? Well, this is because the lipids have their own unique way of absorption. They are typically not placed straight in the bloodstream. They go exactly into the lymphatic stream, specifically the lacteal, and as a consequence, after the filtering portions, these lymphatic capillary will empty in them, will be emptied out in the veins. But nonetheless, the first absorption side of the lipids is the lacteal. And lastly, we have the projection of the smooth muscle. This is to show that we have these villi are actually movable and they can arrange different angulations, different movements, and of course, in order to assure and to ensure the best amount of absor absorptive function in the villi. So this is again the typical picture of the villus. Now, the villus is, of course, these empty spaces. You can guess it yourself. These are the goblet cells because, of course, they are lumucins. And the nuisance and saccharidic glands always have this empty appearance in the microscope. So these are the villi. And exactly means we're going to find some mucus glands. Not everywhere. Specifically, these are the Brunner glands. These mucus secreting glands that can be found only on the duodenum. This is very important. The submucosa here contains these Brunner glands, mucus producing glands, that allow us to distinguish the duodenum from the rest two portions of the small intestine. Because, more or less, with minor differences, the villa will be the same. The, typically speaking, there are some differences in size, but this is not very easy to distinguish in, in the real life microscope. So, your element and your, your characteristics that should help you identify that we are, in, in fact, in the duodenum is the Brunner gland, these mucus glands right here present. Then we're going to have the ileum, sorry, the yes, yeah, the jejunum. The jejunum, in fact, has exactly the same structure, but the submucosa is clear. There are no glands. There is nothing present, just connective tissue present in the submucosa. And lastly, sorry, this is another picture that visualizes very, the very rich vascularization of the uh, of the villi. And lastly, we're going to find the ileum. Now, this is very, again the typical picture of the villus, and again, this is if we zoom in. We can actually see that the difference in the density of the cells, for example, this is the typical lamina propria, and this, in fact, is not lamina propria. If we zoom in, we can actually see cells that have very, very big nuclei with a very small amount of cytoplasm. This is, again, typical for lymphocytes. 
So again, this is the this is called the payers patches. These are again specific lymphoid nodules present in the submucosa of the ilum. And this is how we can identify that we uh, and actually understand that we are in the, in the ilum and not in the other two areas. To sum up, the uh, duodenum has Brunner glands, the mucous glands. The uh, jejunum has nothing specifically, not specific in the submucosa, and the, uh, of course all, the, all of the structures in the submucosa. Again, uh, Brunner's gland, the submucosa in duodenum, nothing in uh, ilo, in jejunum, and the ilum contains the lymphatic nodules, also called Peyer's patches. So, let's actually visualize the structure in the microscope. This is again a duodenum. So if we zoom in on the duodenum, we can find again the villi, the typical appearance of the villi. Again, this is the goblet cell's location, this pyramidally shaped cell. This is again the enterocyte with the macrovilli on the top. This is the lamina propria, the very nice lamina propria. These are the Brunner's glands. This is the, of course, again, the mucus producing segments that we discussed in the sub present in the submucosa. And the rest of the two layers we already know and discussed the muscularis mucosa, the circular, and the longitudinal section of the muscularis externa. So the jejunum, as we can actually see again, we find nothing more than just villi. And then again, this is the gastric pits, the gastric glands, and sorry, the, sorry, excuse me, again, the villi, the absorptive cells, and the crypts, there's a the crypts in a, in a uh, cross section. Then again, this is the sub the submucosa, clear with no specific uh, findings, nothing more than just connective tissue, and of course, vessels. And lastly, we have it again, the typical presence of the small of the smooth connective tissue, the internal, the circular, and the longitudinal on the two different sections. Lastly, the ilum, again, we're going to find, this is a nice section, we're going to actually visualize and find easily the presence of the, uh, of the Peyer's patches. For example, this is right one here, exactly right here, because we can see the density of the cells. So if I zoom in, we will actually visualize exactly this section. We have the villi right here, the villus, and this is the activated, in fact, lymphatic nodule, again, because we can see the difference in the density. This is, again, the the germinal center and the mantle zone surrounding this periphery of the activated center. Okay, actually, this is a very nice structure because we can actually see the nerve, the Meissner's plexus. Exactly, This is the section of the nerve that shows us the, the nerve plexus, the Meissner's plexus. And in fact, we can also see the Auerbach's, which is again between the uh, circular, the inner and outer muscular nerve. Exactly right here, this is the section that contains the nerves of the plexus. Interestingly, to, interesting to know that the Meissner's and Auerbach's together are called enteric nerve plexus. So the term enteric nerve plexus refers to both. My enteric refers to Auerbach's only. So we can move on to the large intestine. So the large intestine is, a specific, is an organ that has a different function. In this case, we have already absorbed all the nutrients that we have from the small intestine, and all that's left is to form the feces and of course reabsorb the water. This is the whole function of the large intestine among others. The primary function of the large intestine is to absorb the water. And this is done through the unique cell called colonocyte. Now the colonocyte, or again, this is again simple colonocyte epithelium, it's a cell that simply absorbs water and that's it. Of course, we're gonna find again goblet cells and in fact here we're gonna find way more goblet cells in proportion to the small intestine because again here in the col the uh, in the large intestine, we find a way higher amount of bacteria, again. So again, where I find the mucosa, typical submucosa is going to have, in fact, also a uh, presence of lymphatic nodules here. Uh, this is very common along the whole large intestine. Very important to notice that we have one unique feature in the uh, large intestine. This is called the tenia coli. We have exactly the same appearance. Again, we have the uh, the mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscularis, and this is the tenia coli. This is the, let's say, exactly this anatomical structure. The tenia coli is actually being easy to, easy to visualize in the microscope because this is nothing more than just a layer of smooth muscle cells. In fact, it's visualized in the microscope. So, this is again, if we zoom in the mucosa, mucosa, the submucosa, and we have the muscularis mucosa, sorry, muscularis, uh, inter, 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 internal muscular, muscular layer, the muscularis externa, and the outer longitudinal layer, this is the tenia coli. 
And if we actually look around the microscope, we can actually find the lymphatic nodules. There we go, there we have it. This is again the mucosa, and in the submucosa we're going to find the extensive areas of the lymphatic nodules. And here again we have an activated lymphatic nodule. This is a primary, this is a secondary. Again, this is a secondary activated. So this is again, it's very, very easy to distinguish and identify the uh, presence of the colon. The last structure we're going to talk about today is the appendix. Now the appendix has a unique function, uh, which is still, to this day, is not fully known, this function of the appendix. And in fact, uh, this is a structure that typically causes appendicitis. This is an infect inflammation and infection of the appendix, in which, of course, the therapy is to remove the appendix. Now, typically speaking, the appendix has the serves the function of sampling the uh, bacterial, the contents of the antigens inside the large, muco the large intestine. The difference is that because we, this is a sampling, let's say, sampling of antigens in the large intestine, this is filled with lymphatic nodules. So it's very, very easy to distinguish again. Again, we have the same mucosa. Again, we're going to find the typical, uh, this is exactly after the, uh, uh, sorry, this is again the enterocytes or sometimes the colonocytes because we're actually, is, we're in the junction between the, uh, close, very close to the junction of the small intestine and the large intestine. And we're going to actually see and visualize the very, very extensive amount of lymphatic tissue present. So again, this is the epithelial covering, again, the mucosa, the mucosa, and we're going to find out large, very large aggregations of lymphatic cells. For example, this is exactly a primary lymphatic nodule, and so on and so on. This is, in fact, a very, very large section. There are very few crypts. We can actually visualize, for example, right now one here. And again, all of the submucosa is filled with lymphatic components. The rest is exactly the same. The muscularis externa is the, the one that has the circular, the circular layer of the, uh, of the mus smooth muscles. And lastly, the longitudinal sections are like very, very small and very uh, like minor presence of these. And the last one, we have the serosa. And this is, again, the mesothelial presence of the, of the meso mesothelial cells along the whole line of the mesothelium. Again, these are vessels. All of these three are vessels. And again, this is a very nice clear section of the internal layer, muscularis, like the, cir the circular, and this is the longitudinal section. Of course, this is long, which you, when you cut in half as a cross section, you can actually visualize this exact orientation of the cells. Thank you very much.